So what's with all the crosses? Well, let me tell you. I have fixed it so that no matter which way you look, if you decide to stare out the window during the sermon, <laughs> no matter which one you choose, you're going to stare at the cross. As a matter of fact, I'd like to point something out to you that Tony pointed out to me. I guess it's been about five or six months ago, and I told him I was going to save this fact for when it was beneficial to me. So, so even if you decide to stare at these doors this morning, take a look right here. Look, just so you notice, there's a cross. So, so everywhere you look this morning, there's a cross. And that's a point. We've been studying this Not a Fan series. Last week we crossed the midway point, and I just want to kind of recap where we've been. We started off the first week with probably the harsh and the controversy and the fact that we shook our faith a little bit when we asked the question, are you a fan or a follower? Fan being just somebody that's an admirer of Jesus, a follower being somebody that's actually following. From the shattered pieces, we began to put the things back together as, as we realized that Jesus gave his invitation to be a follower to anyone. Anyone and everyone could follow Jesus. Last week, we talked about our, our word. Does anybody remember the word for last week? It is? Yada. Yada. There you go. Which means the mingling of souls. It was the come after word, to know and be known completely. And that's how Jesus desires us to come after him. And well, this week, as we continue to examine the invitation that Jesus gave, this is how it reads. If anyone desires to come after me, let him desire, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So if you just follow it along in the scripture and you figure out we talked about the anyone and we talked about the desires to come after me, you know what comes next in the scripture. And before we talk about that, let's talk about the issue that we have. You see, because the reality is we love comfort. We do. We love comfort. I mean, we love physical comfort. That's the reason we have air conditioning in buildings. That's the reason we have heat in buildings. So why we put carpet on the floors for our feet to be comfortable. That's why we put pads on our pews so that other parts of our body can be comfortable. We love the idea of physical comfort. And not just at church. We're going to go home this afternoon. Does anybody have a lazy boy chair in their house? I bet you do. Might even have a lazy boy sofa. And I've already told my wife this afternoon there will be a lazy boy sitting in the lazy boy because I'm tired. We love the idea of the big plushy chairs that we can just, ah, oh, yeah, comfort. We love things like memory foam bed. We love Snuggies, which I don't get. I don't own one, but I understand they're quite comfortable. It looks like a bathrobe turned around backwards to me. But I guess if you're a cold, I probably don't like one because I get hot in 20 degree weather. But I guess if you're a cold nature person, a Snuggie would be quite nice to be able to sit there and put this on and turn the remote without having to get out from underneath the blanket. But we, we love physical comfort. No, we, we, love, we love emotional comfort. We don't want things too harsh. We don't desire to have our feelings hurt. We live in a society where everybody gets a trophy. I never did get that. My, my son played t-ball a few years ago, and at the end of the season, everybody got a trophy. I'm thinking, that's not how it was when I was a kid. They didn't give a trophy to everybody. Only the winners got the trophy. That's not the way it works, because we don't want to, to be emotionally damaging. Hey, we love spiritual comfort, don't we? Think about where we like to spend most of our time talking in church. We want the topics of grace, mercy, joy, peace, and we love the phrase, God is love. We want it comfortable. Here's the problem. Unfortunately, our love for comfort, well, sometimes it eschews the meaning of what it means to be a follower. Sometimes in an effort to get as many people as possible to follow Jesus, I have, with good intentions, made following Him sound as attractive, as appealing as possible. And so I've talked a lot about the unconditional joy 
the peace that passes understanding, the grace and mercy that frees us from all of our guilt and shame. Those things are true and they are beautiful and they should be spoken of often. But I've realized that I have been guilty of selling Jesus. Of emphasizing only the parts about Jesus that I thought people would like. Imagine it this way. Imagine if my oldest daughter grows up and goes to college and after a number of years isn't married, but she really wants to be. And so I decide to help the process along. And I take out an ad in the newspaper and I put up a billboard sign and print up t-shirts begging someone to come and choose her. Wouldn't that cheapen who she is? Wouldn't that make it seem like they were doing her a favor? I would never do that. If you want to come and get to know her, you better come with everything you've got, or I'll send you packing. Have you ever been guilty of this? That words that he used, selling Jesus. I think I can kind of relate to that. I mean, we live in a society where people don't want things to be too uncomfortable, and so I think maybe we're a little guilty of trying to downplay the fact that this isn't supposed to be comfortable. As a matter of fact, comfort is never a requirement. You see, when Jesus gave the invitation, it was a true invitation. He said, anyone can follow. He says, I want you to come at me with all you've got, with passion. But I want you to know something. When you come after me, well, there's that word. You have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. And this morning I want to get back into what does it mean to bear a cross. So if you have your copy of God's word, you can turn to 1 Corinthians. We're going to be right there in chapter 1. And the first thing is we have to embrace the power of the cross. Listen to these words. For Christ did not send me. Now, this me is not me, Barry. This is Christ did not send Paul. Paul is writing this letter to the the Corinthian church. And so he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And I look at that scripture and I understand that this message of Christ, this idea that Christ gave his life on a cross is supposed to be powerful. But those aren't the things that leap out to me. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. But the things that leapt out at me is what Paul says he's not here to do. And the first thing Paul tells him is, I'm not here to baptize. (gasps) Oh my gosh, what do you mean? Paul makes it point blank. My purpose in coming and sharing the gospel isn't to get you dunked in a tank. My purpose in coming and sharing the gospel isn't to add more people to the seats. My purpose isn't just to baptize. You've missed the point if you think this is all about baptism. Paul also goes on and says, you know what? I'm not here to give you words of wisdom. I'm not here to make you smarter. I'm not here to give you the answers to the test so you can fill in the blanks so that when somebody asks you if you're a Christian, you can espouse back all the right answers. Paul says, I'm not here for that. Paul says, you know what? I'm not here to give you a good speech. I'm not here to put on a good show. I'm not here to to be the entertainer. I'm not here to to draw the crowd so that somebody can come to the the carnival atmosphere. Paul says, "I'm, I'm not here for that. And I look at those three things, and you know what? I think sometimes we're guilty of selling Jesus. 
Because aren't these the things that we use to bring people into the church? Hey, come on to church. Come on, you, you need to get baptized. But we don't really understand what it means to be a follower before we get people to do that. We want to tell people, come on to our church. We'll, we'll preach God's word. And, and, and you know what? We'll, we'll give you the answers to the test. Come to our church. It's, it's entertaining. Every now and then the minister actually manages to tell a funny joke. Sometimes he even brings crazy things from the outside world. You just never can tell what you're going to expect. So I began to think about these, and then Paul tells us what he is here to do. He's here to share a powerful message. He's here to open your hearts and your minds to what it means to be a real follower of Jesus. I've gotten a lot of comments on the way that the sign was phrased out front. What does it really mean to follow Jesus? That's why Paul says he's here. And I thought about this, and I thought about this, and, and the best thing I can, I can think about it is, is the fight for life. Now, there's been this crazy thing that's been going on on the Internet here recently where people have been inspired to dump buckets of ice over their head. And I get it. I'm not planning on dumping a bucket of ice over my head. No, thank you. I'm really not that interested in it. But I understand that people feel led to do this, but it's all for a good cause. It's, it's, it's the fight of disease that's called ALS. And it, it's, it's deadly. It's damaging. And so I could have used that as the number one example this morning, but you know what? That's not the one that really hits home for us. See, I got a word I can say, and as soon as I say it, everybody has a connection to it. The word's cancer. If I say that word, it impacts everybody who's sitting here. Because everybody who is sitting here has either had a loved one, or a friend, or a co-worker, or possibly even yourself, that is struggling with cancer. Maybe has been taken home from cancer. And we know about this disease, it's deadly. For much of it, there really is no cure, but there are drugs for it. And the drugs for it, as as Matt was mentioning, chemotherapy, and then we have the word radiation. And you know what? These drugs, well, they're, they're quite powerful. As a matter of fact, these drugs not only kill good cells, they kill bad ones too. That's just what they do. They have massive side effects. They leave bad tastes in your mouth. They leave tingling in your limbs, and it's just, just not good. And I began to think about this, and I'm thinking, what's wrong with these doctors? I don't get it. I mean, here you have this person that has this, this diagnosis of cancer. Why on earth would you make their life worse? Why would you give them drugs that give them all of these side effects? And here's the reality. Because when the doctors start fighting cancer, your comfort isn't their concern. They're they're not interested in whether or not the drugs make you feel better. They're interested in if the drugs make you better. And that's hard sometimes. Especially when you've gone through it or you've seen other people fighting it. But the reality is, is that, you know what? Powerful drugs... They're all about healing. They're all about fixing the things that are broken. There is no snuggy theology in the cancer ward of hospitals. It doesn't exist. If you ever sat there and you've had that diagnosis, you understand the doctors lay it all out there in front of you. They they don't hold anything back. They let you know exactly what you're in for. Sometimes I wonder if we took that approach in the church... Our numbers may not go up as quickly, but maybe our followers would be a little more dedicated to what they're doing. See, because what we really need to understand is that we are fighting a disease that is deadlier than cancer. If left untreated, it has a 100% mortality rate. Its impact does not end at the grave but it carries all the way through eternity. 
You know what that is? It's sin. That's what Jesus came to combat. Jesus didn't come to gather a following that would give him pep rally parades and sing just because they wanted to sing. He came because he was trying to combat a disease that's terminal. It's called sin. And so when Jesus makes this idea that you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me, when he gives you the prescription to the disease that you're going to have to deny yourself and, well, follow, this meant something to the Jewish people. See, because as Jesus made that statement and they were standing there, they could look up on the hill right outside the city and guess what there was on the hill? There were the poles that go up this way that probably stayed there all the time where they would hoist people up onto that cross. See, when Jesus made the statement, take up your cross, deny yourself, people understood that meant pain. That meant suffering. That meant shame. That meant death. See, I'm, I'm not sure that we get that. I mean, we, at Easter time, we sing the song, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. But do you really get what the cross is? In our society, it's jewelry. It's decoration. It's comfortable. We smooth them down and shellac them and make them pretty. We make them attractive to look at. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a piece of jewelry that's in the shape of a cross, but I'm just trying to help you understand. If that's what you think taking up a cross and following me means, you've missed the point. You see, when Paul writes this letter to the Corinthian church, he talks about the cross right here in chapter 1. He wants to make sure they get it. So after he begins to tell them what he's not here to do, he gives a great dissertation on what it means to carry a cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 reads, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us that are being saved is the power of God. You realize I say this idea of carrying a cross, and for somebody that isn't interested in following Jesus, that just flat out sounds dumb. I mean, why would I do this? And that's kind of the point. You see, at the point the cross stops being foolish is the point at which I think you begin to become a follower. At the point when denying yourself doesn't seem like an option, I think that's the point at which you start becoming a follower. Because you need to understand comfort isn't a requirement. In fact, there is absolutely no way to carry a cross comfortably. Listen to Luke chapter 6, verse 22. It says, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. See, if you carry this cross, if you become a follower, people are going to mock you. They're going to ridicule you. They're going to come up name, They're going to come up with names for you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to even look at you. Maybe you're a little bit strange, but you understand. The verse says, deny yourself, take up your cross. There is no easy way to do this. Philippians 1.29 says, For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. So here's a question I want to ask you. Is your faith costing you anything? We all like a good bargain, don't we? We all like to, to see the thing that's been going around. It's called BOGO. You know, it took me months to figure out what BOGO was. I went by CVS, and they had the sign that says BOGO. And I'm like, what is a BOGO? And then it was actually Diane that says, it means buy one, get one. Oh, okay, I finally got it. It took somebody to explain. Some, I'm a little dense, okay? But we all like a good bargain. We all like to find things on sale. And unfortunately, I think we are looking for a bargain when it comes to Jesus. And he's not found at the dollar store, I'm sorry. 
You see, it's going to cost you to serve him. It means you're going to have to suffer some things. Some things are going to have to go out of your life. And if you're unwilling to do that, you know what? You're just an enthusiastic admirer. That's the definition of fandom. I just want to sit in the seat and cheer. I don't want it to cost me anything. See, there is the difference. As we continue moving forward, we find out about this cross. Well, it's a stumbling block for many. I found this interesting. This, this idea came up this morning in Sunday school about a stumbling block. And Paul was encouraging the Corinthian church in the second book of Corinthians not to let their ministry be a stumbling block. And we got into the discussion of, well, where does that begin and end? And do we cheapen the gospel? Just exact opposite. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 through 24. Jews demanded signs and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But those who God has called, both Jew and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You see, there is a reality here that when you begin to follow Jesus, when you begin to look at Jesus hard, your life is going to become a stumbling block sometimes. See, as you carry that cross and people think you look foolish and silly because you're giving up this or you're doing that just because you want to follow Jesus, well, other people are going to look at your life and say, well, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go through that. And so the idea that you are selling out to follow Jesus means other people are going to look at it and say, I don't think so. And you know what? That's okay. See, because when we make Christianity totally comfortable, When we just make it where it's the cookie cutter, you come in and you do the five-point checklist, and then we stamp on your head, saved, going to heaven, thumbs up, and then we let you go back out, and you just live your life any way you want it, and there's no commitment to it whatsoever, there is no take up your cross and follow me, then you know what? We don't make Christians. We just make lost people that are harder to convince that they're not a Christian because their life isn't about Jesus. That's the difference between a fan and a follower. So you would much rather have somebody stumble over the truth than to be lost in the darkness, wouldn't you? Live your life like you're living it for Jesus. It may cause some people some difficulties, but that's okay. At least they'll have an honest example of what it means to be a Christian. Here's something you have to understand. Carrying a cross will turn you around. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. I want you to note the upside-down world that Jesus lived in. See, if I was going to pick disciples and apostles, I probably would have picked a few political leaders, some people with some clout, I probably would have picked the world's best public speakers. I probably would have picked some people that had some charismatic attitudes. I probably would have picked some people that have a marketing background and some salesmanship to them. Jesus picked fishermen and carpenters and tax collectors because he wanted people to understand, I choose the things that are weak, and out of their weakness will come strength. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I've got to tell you the truth. I don't know when's the last time I actually delighted in difficulties. I'm human, and so I will tell you, usually when difficulties come, I complain. But these aren't the difficulties that Paul's talking about as far as, you know, you've got some struggles. What he's talking about is when it becomes difficult to be a follower. Paul delights in the fact that when it's difficult to be a follower. Because you know what? When it's difficult to be a follower and I still follow, then that means the world can look around and they have an example to follow. When I can take persecution, when I can let people ridicule me, 
and I could still continue to follow, then you know what? That gives people an example. When my life goes through hard, struggling, tough times, and I still follow, well, that gives people that example. That's why Paul's resume that he puts out there where he talked about how many times he had been beaten and the fact that he had been shipwrecked and the fact that, that he had been flogged, the fact that they actually tried to stone the man to death. He says, I put it all out there just so you know. I got right back up from what I was doing and I followed some more. That's the point. Paul never did this perfectly. He had his complaints. He had his moments of weakness. He had his grumbles with Christ. He had his grumbles with God. He begged God to remove things out of his life, just like we do. It isn't that he did this ultra perfectly. But here's the thing. He did it ultra consistently. Every time you knocked the man down, he was like one of those punching bags that my kids like. You ever seen the Bozo the Clown punching bags? You set the thing up and you pop! And down it goes and it pops right back up. And you punch it again and it pops down and it pops. It refuses to stay down unless you get a pin. That works wonders. But, if you, but the, the punching bag continues to come back up. It refuses to quit. It's going to continue doing what it's doing. That's the call of the cross. That's what God's looking for in followers. People that just won't quit. Clinging to the cross. It's part of that song, isn't it? In that verse, I will cling to the old rugged cross. And then what am I supposed to do with it? Exchange it one day for a crown? Well, there's some things that I want you to know that you have to do if you're going to actually cling to that cross. And the first thing you have to do is you have to admit you're weak. You know, that's the first step in knowing you have a problem is admitting you have one, right? Solving the problem means I have to confess the idea that, you know what, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. Minutely, sometimes secondly. Sometimes I'm surprised how many mistakes I can make in a, in a day. It's, it's amazing. I didn't think there was that much time in a day, but it is. I've got weaknesses. I've got issues. And you know what? That's okay. Jesus is okay with your issues. He can deal with your weaknesses. But what you do have to do is you have to be willing to accept exactly what's going on, and accept sacrifice as a way of life. Before he tells these people that they have to take up their cross, he says he uses that word, deny yourself. Deny. Here's the definition. Refuse to give or grant something requested or desired to someone now, in this case, that someone, when Jesus says you were to not deny, who are you supposed to deny? Well, yourself. It means that there are going to be things in your life and things in your path that you are going to want, and it means that there's going to be temptation that is there, and it means you're going to have to deny it. The analogy I get is the idea of a diet. If you ever been on a diet, it's uncomfortable. I can tell you if I go on a diet, I get irritable. I'm not the most pleasant person in the world to deal with if I decide to go on a diet. The funny thing is, if you actually go on a diet and you do it the way it's supposed to be, in the short term, it does. It makes you weaker. Because your body has to adjust to the reduced amount of fuel you're feeding it. And so your body actually feels a little lethargic the first time you start going into diet mode. But you know what? If you stick with it, it'll change you. It'll rearrange your life. But the thing is, is you have to do some denial when you're on a diet, don't you? You know, the waitress comes by with the little tray and it's got the strawberry cheesecake sitting there. You have to say no to the strawberry cheesecake, even though your mouth is like, I like the strawberry cheesecake. It looks good. My eyes are like, it looks yummy, but you have to say no to it. Why? Well, it isn't because strawberry cheesecake is evil. It's because I've chosen a way of life. Okay, maybe it's evil. I don't know. Uh, strawberry cheesecake isn't evil, but I've chosen a way of life. I'm trying to accomplish something in my life that will change my life, and that means I have to deny some things from my life. 
That's the image Jesus wants you to get of what it means to be a follower. Some things are going to have to go out of your life to make room for Jesus. And that's harsh. That doesn't sell well to the masses. In a society where we want our popcorn in a minute and 30 seconds and our Big Macs in less than a minute, it doesn't sell well to tell people, if you're going to follow Jesus, then you have to give up some things. But that's exactly what Jesus said. He says this is going to cost you a little bit. It's going to hurt you a little bit. The gift is free, but to use it, it might cost you everything. As a matter of fact, it will cost you everything. So the next thing that we have to think about is we have to refuse to cheapen the cross. That's a big deal. Because I think we do it. We sell Jesus cheap to the masses. We put the clearance tag on him, come one, come all. We won't make you feel too guilty. We won't make this too complicated for you. Just please come and sit so that we can get the numbers where we want it to be. And let's just keep on a moving. We'll do everything and anything that we possibly can. Let's just make sure we keep moving forward. And I think when Jesus cried out this invitation, take up your cross and follow me, I want to tell you something. The people that he was talking to that day, well, he got their attention. Matter of fact, he got their attention so much that a great many of them turned and said, I don't think so, I'm going home. This isn't what I signed up for. I signed up to have the 5,000 fed. I signed up to see the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear. I signed up for the pep rallies and the masses. I signed up to be entertained and to feel comfortable. And Jesus rewrote the equation and said, you know what? This isn't going to be comfortable. If that's why you're coming... You're going to be sadly disappointed. Because let me tell you what's in your future. It's a cross. That's what he told them. And they went home. So here is the reality of the situation. Fans, they're comfortable displaying a cross. I bet you nobody is offended at the fact that I went downstairs and raided the cabinets and took all the little crosses that were in the cabinet and I brought them up here and I set them all. Nobody, that doesn't offend anybody, does it? As a matter of fact, we have one that sits right on our stage every single week. There used to be one right there on the back wall before it finally gave up the ghost and took a swan dive off the back wall there and broke into a bunch of different pieces. That we, we don't have a problem with displaying a cross. I know lots of people that have no idea what it means to be a Christian, but they'll go down to the tattoo parlor and they'll have a cross tattooed right on their arm. They don't have a problem displaying a cross. We'll put them on our bumper stickers. It's kind of funny, we adorn our churches with them just so people will know this is a church. That in itself kind of seems odd to me. We have to put a cross up so people know it's a church. We can display it. But that's what a fan does. A follower, he picks it up and he carries it. A follower says, Jesus, where you went, that's where I'm going to go. Even if it costs me everything, that's a follower. Now here's the question. Which did Jesus call? Somebody that's willing to display a cross? Or somebody that's willing to carry one? Oh, wow, I don't think I like this anymore. Because if all you're willing to do is display a cross, to tell people with your mouth that you're a Christian, Jesus says, look out. That's the definition of a fan. You are an admirer of Jesus. When you become to the point that it costs you something, your life is modified because of your religion. Your relationship is the better word. Jesus says that's when following actually begins to happen. Not the ending point. That was the starting point of the relationship. That sounds much different than the way we push church these days, doesn't it? That sounds like, oh my gosh, I've got to let this affect the rest of my life. That's the point. 
So here's the question. Are you a fan or a follower? We're going to do a time of decision, and I'm going to leave that question just kind of hanging. It's the question we've asked weeks and weeks and weeks. We started asking it before we ever preached the first sermon. Are you a fan or a follower? Which one are you? Maybe you should use this decision time to put some serious thought to that idea. And maybe the measuring point in your life should be, what are you doing with your cross? Maybe it's still shoved in the back closet somewhere because you know what, you're tired of looking at that thing. Maybe you've painted it and shined it up and you've made it very presentable to the world. Or maybe it really is like on the hill far away. It's just this rugged old ugly piece of wood still covered in the bark, still stained with the blood. Maybe that's your cross. And the only thing you can do with it is is you can just carry it. It's not something anybody really wants to look at. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ, you're still living in that fan mode, let me encourage you, come on forward. I'll sit down, we'll turn the pages, and I'll show you what it means to really have a relationship with Jesus. Not one that's cheap. Not one that comes, buy one, get one free. Not one that's going to be easy, but one that means change in your life, but it means eternal life. Maybe you're here today and this message has got to you a little bit. You know what? You've got some things in your life you need to deal with. I'll tell you a great place to come and deal with them, right there. You can come and you can kneel and you can pray and you can give them to Jesus. If you don't know what to pray, come on forward. I'll pray with you. Whatever you need to do. Maybe what you need to do is right there at your seat, you just need to confess to God, you know what? I'm guilty. Displaying the cross and not carrying it. Lord, help me. Change me.